uh, many, many others. Okay, well, let's do this as we uh, get prepared, just waiting just a second to get a, a few more people on here. I want to I want to talk about this idea of home shows being canceled. And my company, for those of you who aren't familiar, Level 10 Contractor, here's what we do. We're a company that does consulting and uh, lead generation in the home improvement and home services industry. Been doing this for a lot of years. We're in our 26th year of business. We've been specializing in home improvement and remodeling for uh, about 15 years since I met Tim in 2005, and he got, kind of got me uh, into this particular industry. And I want to tell you something. When pandemic hit in March, I think I was pretty much like everybody else. I thought, oh, my gosh, this could go a lot of different ways. And the way that I thought it was going to go most of all was we're all screwed. I mean, the economy is going to shrink. It's going to be a problem. People are going to be staying home. What's going to happen? Well, it turns out, I don't know what you guys are like uh, on this webinar, but for my client base, it is been across the board a giant boom and uh clients are having their best months their best years ever it's uh it's amazing i guess when people sit around home and have nothing but but looking at their walls and deciding they don't like them to do they decide they want to do home improvement so that's been good but the downside has been this idea that uh shows and events have been either massively curtailed or you know canceled altogether and also along with that, uh, other face-to-face, in-person kind of marketing, like uh, canvassing has taken a big hit. Uh, I know it's coming back a little bit for some people, but I want to tell you what happened. I, I run a daily podcast, and uh, we get something like 2,000 uh, downloads a week. A lot of people listening to this podcast. So I started getting calls from people who say, hey, I've been on your podcast, and I got a question for you. Um, we can't do shows. I had a guy call me that does 400 shows and events a year. Another one that called me that does 300 and uh, several that are in the 200 range, like massively depending on these shows and events, a huge part of everything they do. And they're calling me saying, what do we do? Literally, what do we do? We, we can't do the major thing that gets the majority of our leads. And with some companies, of course, it's a smaller percentage of their leads, but still important. And uh, that's what we're going to talk about today is the answer that I've been giving people in one-on-one -on -one consultations is exactly what we're going to talk about here today. So like you see on the, uh, the slide, show canceled. And I know some of these uh, places around the country, they're like, oh, well, we're, we're maybe going to do it and we're going to do a, a different version and a smaller version. And then they just come back and say, nope, sorry, canceled. Then they're like, oh, we got this great idea. We'll do a virtual home show. So that doesn't seem to really work that well. In fact, I haven't heard a single positive thing about the virtual home shows. Maybe somebody has, and if, if so, more power to you, but uh, it's a problem. So we've got to find what to do instead. And uh, look, here's the reality. This is probably going to last a while. It's probably going to last at least through the spring with curtailed or canceled shows. So let's do a, uh, let's do a poll right now. Uh, Josh, if you don't mind launching that, let's get a feel in your area with your situation. What's happening with home shows and events? Yeah, Rich, what I'm finding is even the events that are still happening, they're super scaled down. So the amount of attendees, it just cut in half, maybe even 25 percent. So the leads you expect to receive from that home show are just you know, completely diminished. So, yeah, this is definitely a great topic. I'm excited to have everybody on here to, to talk about ways we can keep leads flowing between now and I guess March and April is about when home show season ends. Yeah. I want to know, I, I see that uh, 5% as the poll is rolling out here said that the events and shows are still happening. I want to know where that is. It's where everybody needs to move to. It's probably what, Florida, Arizona, Texas. I don't really know. Probably Florida. <laughs> I think Florida, didn't Florida come back and say that that's it. We're done. Pandemic's canceled to go back to work. I think they said that. But, uh, you know, I've got, I've got clients in uh, Michigan. And, you know, the lockdown's pretty tight there. But they're, they're finding ways. They're finding ways. All right, you want to go ahead and, and show the, these results here? Yeah, we're looking at 5% said still happening. 34% said some are canceled or postponed. And then 
a, a bulk of, of you folks, 61% uh, canceled or postponed. So glad you joined us today. This is topic is gonna be super relevant. Yeah, here, here's what else I wanna know. Hey, 5% that aren't canceled, what are you doing on the webinar? You, you've got shows. I'm kidding. It's good. You're going to learn stuff anyway. That's important. <laughs> but uh, yeah, sixty something percent said it's completely donezo. So we gotta we gotta figure something out. So uh, let's let's go to what we're going to talk about today. First thing, I'm going to cover lead generation strategies that are going to work for you between now and March. And honestly, not just through March, through you know kind of, what is it, Buzz Lightyear to infinity and beyond. We're going to uh, talk about some stuff that. If you look, here's the deal. If you can get these things in place and you can get them up and running and working, then it's going to it's going to give you another way to generate leads. Even if and when uh, shows come back, it's going to give you another pillar of lead generation. Then uh, I'm going to hand the baton over to Tim Mush from Market Sharp. He's going to talk about what you do when you get the lead. There's a lot of optimization that really probably needs to happen. I'm going to strike that from the record. Not probably definitely needs to happen. And uh, Tim's going to kind of walk you through a bunch of different strategies of how to maximize and optimize the leads that you do have. I mean, think about it this way. If you've got a, a hundred leads per month, just hypothetically using a round number and you can, let's say 5% efficiency increase on those, it's going to make a major difference. And uh, I'm going to tell you from firsthand experience working with contractors all over the country, this is a major, major, major issue. And uh, Tim, is probably the most qualified person I know to talk about this. So we'll be getting to that in just a second. The third thing we're going to talk about is um, getting unsold leads to buy. I call this digital rehash and Josh may call it something different, but here's what we're talking about. Hey, guess what? You went out and you closed 30% of the leads that you have after you optimize them with what Tim's going to teach you. Congratulations. You just closed 30%, but here's what you also just did. You just didn't close 70%. Nobody ever wants to talk about that or look at that. They're like, oh, well, they didn't close. Why didn't they close? Well, because they were broke. They were stupid. They were whatever. All these reasons why they didn't close and sort of people just assume that because they didn't close that they're not going to close and they can't close and they're not closable. And uh, Josh is going to throw a giant bucket of water on that whole thought process and show you that, nope, they're closable. You just have to have a process and a plan for doing it and I'm going to tell you something. What he's going to show you is so easy and so effective and so inexpensive. And Josh, I don't know if Josh likes it when I say this or not. I'm going to say it anyway. If you don't do it, you're dumb. I'm just putting it out there. I'm just going to put it out there. You decide. You watch. You decide. Hear me now. Believe me later. We're going to get to that in just a second. All right. Before I get started on the first part with uh, lead generation strategies, we're going to do some giveaways. And uh some might look at the giveaways and think that they're a bribe to keep you on the webinar to the very, very end. And those people might be right, but hey, chance to get something for nothing. Let's, let's go for it. We're going to give away a free book, Unlocking Unlimited Lead Flow. This is a book that I wrote. I want you to notice it's a big, fat, thick book. It is, uh, what, how many pages is it? 390 something pages. Uh, everything that we're going to talk about in my segment today is in there. Some of the stuff that Tim's going to talk about is in there. Some of the stuff that Josh talks about is going to be in there. Uh, building websites, identity, SEO. Um, yeah, Tim's got, it's, it's blurred, Tim. Come on. Yeah, hold it up closer. All right, so that's in the book. We're going to give that away. And uh, we're also going to give away a six-month subscription to Market Sharp, $720 value. I was going to try to get Tim to go for a full year, but uh, we'll, we'll go for six months. That's good. And then Josh, he's going to give away a month of Hatch for free. This is going to give you an opportunity to try this thing out that I'm talking about that is revolutionary and life-changing. And uh, he's going to make it so that if – here's what he's going to do. I'm telling you right now that if you don't do it, that's dumb. And he's going to say, here, I'll let you do it for free. Do the math on that. If, like, I won't even try it? Come on. you got to try it. Okay. <laughs> So that's going to that's gonna happen at the very end of the webinar. So stick around for that. And uh, let's jump into the first segment here, which is what lead sources should you be looking at or giving another chance? Now, I want you to pay close attention on the screen to the wording. Should you look at or give another chance? Because I'm going to tell you, the, I'm, I'm going to talk about two things. And I'm going to tell you right now that your reaction to the two things is probably going to be, we tried that and it didn't work. We've done that. It doesn't work. And I want you to know that the things that I'm going to show you 
are working consistently across the country with different kinds of companies and different segments of remodeling. You just have to know how to make them work. And hopefully that's what we're going to cover and talk about here. So keep an open mind. Let's go. First thing, Facebook advertising. <clears throat> now, first thing you need to understand about Facebook is when people use the word Facebook as it relates to marketing, it's hard for people to understand what I'm talking about half the time because Facebook is like a Swiss army knife. It's got different blades that do different things. There's like a, a fork and there's a knife and there's like a corkscrew and a pair of scissors and a saw. And if you say the word Facebook without de defining which of the blades you're going to pull open, then people get a little bit confused. What I'm not talking about here is posting content for the people that follow you to see. So you've got a Facebook page, you've got 1,000 followers, and you put stuff on there two, three, four times a day, and people see it, they like it, they're excited, and hopefully that generates leads. That is not what I'm talking about. What I'm talking about right now is paid advertising, and here's what you need to understand. And I've talked to enough uh, contractors that I know, I'm going to say something right now, I don't want to offend anybody, I'm just keeping it real. There are a certain percentage of you that don't really know what Facebook does. If you've heard of it, you're familiar with it, kind of but you don't use it personally. So I just want you to understand what happens is people have their phone and they're looking at Facebook. And as they're flipping through, they see a post from their grandchildren. They see a post from, um, you know, a kid that they knew from high school. And these are all the core content that they're trying to look at on Facebook. And in the middle of those posts, ads pop up and they scroll through. And Facebook is very, very good at sending just the right ad to just the right person based on a thousand points of data that they have on you. It's, it's a little bit creepy. They're kind of spying on you to a certain extent, to a big extent, but that's good because it makes them feed ads to you in your Facebook feed that are more relevant uh, and likely to be something that you're interested in. That's what I want to talk about. Facebook advertising. Okay. So as we focus on paid advertising, here's what we've got to look at. There's different ways to do it. So there's different things you can do with Facebook, and then within the category of paid advertising, there's different things you can do. One of the things you can do is you can run an ad, and I'll show you some examples of ads in just a second. You can run an ad that has different options of, that, of things that people can do. One of them is you can put a little button on there that says send more information, and if somebody clicks on that, Facebook will literally send you, the advertiser, the information that they have on file contact-wise for that person. Now, the problem with that is that person has seen your ad for anywhere from one to 11 seconds. They clicked a button. Now you're getting an email that says, hey, this person's name is John Smith and they live in this town and here's their phone number. And I'm telling you, that's what we call a high funnel lead. In other words, they don't know that much. They're kind of a tire kicker. They haven't had a chance to really understand who you are, how you're different, why you're better, what this is all about, what they can expect when they do business with you. And so it's very frustrating because contractors get these leads and number one they find them difficult to get a hold of part of the reason is that information that facebook is sending you may not even be accurate anymore if they signed up for facebook in 2009 and now it's 2020 they may have a different email they may never they may not even see your emails or get your phone calls uh to even have a chance so what we want to do is not that we don't want to put a button that says learn more and facebook automatically sends you that is a bad way to do it for most companies in fact i would say for all companies so then here's another way that you can generate leads. You see it on the screen. It says Facebook Messenger. What this is, it's an ad that says at the bottom, a little button that says send message. And what happens is if somebody clicks that send message button from your ad, it'll pop up a Facebook Messenger chat. It's essentially a chat. It's like a text message back and forth, or it's a chat, however you want to call it. Now, here's the problem with that. Number one, you better have somebody there ready to chat with people 24 hours a day, seven days a week. If you don't, then they're going to try to chat with you and nobody's going to be there. And that's not good. Number two, even if you do have somebody there to chat, this person, again, because they don't know hardly anything about your company other than what they saw in this ad, they're going to be a very high funnel kind of lead. In other words, they're going to want to know a lot of information and your person is going to have to walk them through and push them down that funnel and it's time consuming and it's laborious. So while that is a decent way to generate leads, it does require a lot of handholding. It's very high touch. 
I really don't recommend it for most companies. Okay, so here's what I just did. I just checked off two things that I don't want you to do for Facebook paid advertising. I don't want you to do the uh, send info and I don't want you to do the Facebook Messenger. But here's what I do want you to do. What I call a mid-funnel lead. Now what we're talking about is having an ad. Again, I'll show you an example in just a second. And it has uh, a little button at the bottom that says more information or learn more, something like that. And when they click on that, it's going to take them to what we call a squeeze page or a squeeze site. Now a squeeze page is a one page uh, website that says fill out this form and become a lead. What's better than that in my experience is what I call a squeeze site, which is gonna be about five pages long. And I'll show you an example of this in just a second, about five pages that gives people enough information that they can determine who you are, how you're different, why you're better, what they can expect when they do business with you. They learn enough about who you are and what you're all about that when they fill out that form or when they call that phone number, they actually have a pretty decent idea, number one, that they want to do this. Number two, they're aware that you're going to try to contact them to set an appointment. And number three, they're a lot more likely to become an actual sit and therefore a sale. Okay, so this is what we want to do. So let's go to the next slide. I'm going to show you uh, samples of what these ads look like. This is for a company called Kitchen Tune-Up. They're up in uh, Boise, Idaho, also down in Salt Lake and other parts of Idaho. <laughs> but you can see these are two similar ads that uh, are scaled differently for, I think the one on the left would be more of a uh, uh, desktop look and the one on the right is more of a, a, an iPhone or a cell phone look. And you can see the, the uh, ad is very straightforward. It's got a beautiful picture. Look what you can do uh, to your kitchen in less than a week for less than $250 a month. Sonny, right. Read to the end to find out how to get $2,000 off your project. Now, look down there at the bottom. It says, new kitchen in two to five days. And then there's a button there, learn more. The other ad, very similar, amazing uh, kitchen makeover in two to five days. So what are you waiting for? Let us help you build your dream kitchen. Get a free design consultation. Learn more. If somebody clicks the learn more button, it's not going to initiate a chat because I told you we don't want to do that. It's not going to automatically send you that person's contact information. That's too high in the funnel. That's going to drive you crazy and make you hate Facebook advertising and complain to people like me that it doesn't work. That's what that'll do. But here's what will happen. They'll click on the learn more button and it will go to a squeeze site. Let's go to the next slide and I'll show you what that looks like. All right, there it is. Kitchen tune-up. Completely transform your kitchen in just two to five days for $99 to $249 a month. A stunning new kitchen makeover in two to five days. Absolutely. If you were to scroll down, which you can't on this slide because it's just a screenshot, you would see more information about how that works. Now, I want you to notice up here at the top navigation bar. Here's what we've got. We've got a home page, a services page, and in this particular company, they've got uh, four or five different services. Advantages, that's uh, communicating who this company is, how they're different, why they're better, what they, what people can expect when they do business with them. And then there's a project gallery that's going to show something like eight or 10 before and afters. Here's what it used to look like. Here's what it looks like now, right? And then testimonials and then FAQs. And then the final one is free kitchen design consultation. Now here's the key word that I want you to take out of this. The key word is friction. We are purposefully adding friction into this this uh, system so that people can qualify themselves either in or out of becoming a lead. Here's what we do not want. We do not want a bunch of people that saw something about a kitchen and said, oh, that looks kind of interesting. I don't, don't, don't know what it is, but yeah, I don't know. Give me more information. We don't want that. We want people to push themselves down that funnel, so to speak, so that they have a better idea of what they're getting into. And so here's what's going to happen. The natural result of that is very obvious, I hope. Number one, you're going to get fewer leads. Number two, the leads are going to be more expensive. Number three, the leads are going to be better quality. So you have to kind of choose. You want a lot of leads that are not very good, or do you want relatively fewer leads that are more qualified and ready to buy? That's what we've determined with our clients. That's what they want. I think that's probably what you want. Let's go to the next slide. This shows you what it looks like on mobile. You need to realize that about 90 something percent of all Facebook activity happens on mobile phones, not on computer desktops or, or something like that. So this is just a, a quick view of what these pages look like when you see them um, on mobile view. Kitchen tune up advantage, we're fast, we're affordable. Here's some frequently asked questions. 
How is kitchen tune-up different from traditional remodeling? Look, I want you to I, I, look. I know you can't read that necessarily because it's small print, but I want you to get a feel for what we're doing here. Frequently asked questions: How is kitchen tune-up different from traditional remodeling? And then it talks about how they want to tear everything out of your kitchen. They want to start over. It takes four to ten weeks. It costs twenty-five to seventy-five thousand dollars. Here's how we do it. It's different. We start with cabinets. Here's different ways of doing it. Oh, then the next question, what are the different ways you can remodel my kitchen and which is right for me? If you were to go to that page on this squeeze page, you would see that there's about eight or 10 uh, different FAQs, again, creating friction. And then of course they can click on the button to um, get started. They fill out the form. And then when they fill out that form, here's what happens. Next slide, please. You get this in your email instantaneously <laughs> and it looks like this, it's a lead. And uh, you can see this is from Kitchen Tuna Boise. I think this just came in last Saturday. Uh, Rachel from uh, Boise, she was interested in, a, a, it says there's something else. That means that it, what, it didn't fit something that was on the list. Her anticipated budget, ten dollars to $15,000 she wants to meet on Saturday morning. It's a great lead right here. Very good lead. This is what we're seeing. This is what's generated. I want to tell you something. I want to go back to what I said before. Very quickly, I want you to understand this. It is very easy to do this wrong, to screw it up, and to get crappy results. And then people raise their hand and they say, Rich, you are wrong. Facebook sucks. We've tried it and it didn't work. I want you to know everything in life has a right way and a wrong way that it can be done. Facebook is no different. If you start going into Facebook yourself and you start trying to fiddle with the settings and serve the ads, it's hard. You have to have a certain level of expertise. All right, let's go to the next slide if you don't mind. I'll show you how this works. When we work with clients on Facebook advertising, it's very simple. We charge $1,500 to put the squeeze page slash squeeze site together, set up the account in Facebook, and then we recommend a 100-day, excuse me, $100 per day starting budget. That's going to be times 30 days, about $3,000 a month. We charge uh, either $1,500 or 15% of the spend to manage that for you and to make it happen. So here's what I want you to consider, and here's what I want you to think about, okay? If the CPM's cost per thousand impressions is about twelve to twenty-five dollars, let's say it's fifteen to eighteen is pretty typical. That's that's going to be about three times higher than radio and television. That's going to be about ten times less than direct mail. I don't know how it compares to uh, home shows, but it's going to give you a lead cost that's going to range from about sixty to two hundred dollars. That's what we're seeing. The the sweet spot in there is about a hundred to one hundred and twenty dollars. Now, I want you to run math on that because here's what I do. I sit around and run math because really your most important marketing tool is your calculator. Think about this. If you were to spend, let's grab the calculator, $3,000 on a $100 a day spend plus $1,500 for somebody to manage that. So let's just go with the $3,000 because that's what we're calculating the uh, $120 lead on. That's going to be 25 leads. 25 leads. What's your closing ratio? What's your closing ratio? Well, let's say it's 30%. And uh, Josh, we're going to give you a chance in just a second to up that closing ratio, but hold, hold your horses. We're getting to you. I'm almost done here. So if you've got 25 leads and you're closing 30%, that's seven and a half uh, deals. Let's round it down and say it's only seven. So you've got seven deals that you close on a $4,500 spend. If your average deal is $10,000, which seems pretty typical for window guys, it could be much more for other kinds of companies. $70,000 in sales on $4,500. But guys, I'm going to tell you something. This is a 100% no-brainer. It is a want. Look, let's get real. If you're struggling for leads because of home shows being gone, which is the whole reason we're here today, I'm suggesting that you try $4,500 to get the thing up and running on the promise of about $100 to $120 leads, which is going to produce somewhere in the neighborhood on the low end of 20, on the high end of about 40 leads. If you close them at 30%, do the math, it, it, it just works. And I'm going to tell you something. Our Facebook business over here at Level 10 Contractor has absolutely exploded since the pandemic for this exact reason. In other words, when Tim and Josh come to me and say, hey, let's do a webinar about what to do in the pandemic because the home shows are gone, my very first thing I said was, no brainer, Facebook. Here's what happens. It works. So next slide. All right, now we're gonna talk about TV and radio advertising. And I want you to know something about TV and radio advertising. I know you've tried it and I know it didn't work and I know you quit. I know that. 
because I've talked to a thousand contractors in my career and everybody's tried it and the majority say it didn't work and the majority quit. You know who's still running TV and radio? Funny thing. Oh, all the huge companies that are doing 10, 20, 30, 40, 50 million in sales. That's who's doing TV and radio advertising. Think about that for a second. Radio and TV are like everything else. Like I said, it's going to depend on how you execute it. There's three major variables, the buy, and I'm going to tell you something. It is super easy to screw up the buy. I talked to a guy just yesterday. They've been on TV for 10 something years in the uh, uh, New England area. And I asked him specific details about his buy. And his answer was, and, and I'm not trashing the guy. I'm just telling you, this is super typical. He said, I don't really know. I don't really know what our CPMs are. I don't really know these other stations that we're not on, why we're not on and why it's not working and what we need to do different. He just didn't know. It's not the expertise that most contractors have. The, the creative, massively critical. Same person I was talking to you yesterday. It said, send me, you hear me okay? I've got some static going in there. All right, it's gone. I said, send me your ads that you're running. The ads were super generic. They had super generic offers. They had super generic voiceover. They were, they were like the super genericest ads that anyone's ever seen in their life. And he's still having success with them, but he knows that he can do better. Here's what we want to do. We want to create something called an identity for your company, who you are, how you're different, why you're better, what people can expect when they do business with you. We want to communicate it with power, precision, and passion, put it out there on a consistent and frequent basis, and here's what happens. I know this is what happens. It works. You just have to execute it right. Now, from a budgeting standpoint, this is going to be a little bit more difficult than Facebook, which is why it's the second thing that I'm bringing to your attention and not the first thing. I put these in order of what you should try first, what you should try second. But if you're in that kind of category of maybe we should do some TV and radio advertising, maybe we should revisit this, maybe this is something we should take a look at, here's what you need to realize. You're going to get some leads from TV and radio, but it is going to take some time for it to fully mature. It is a farming activity. You plant the seeds, you nurture, you prune, you water, the sunshine, all of that stuff. And in the fall, you harvest. So you need to spend money that you can, infor you can afford to invest. And it says there on the screen, when is the best time to plant a tree? And the answer is 20 years ago. The second best time to plant a tree right now, today. Here's what I'm talking about. What do you think is going to happen to the economy? Answer, it's going to go up and it's going to go down. At some point, it'll go down. At some point, it'll go up. And all these things are going to happen. Right now is the best time to start future-proofing your marketing against anything that could happen so that next time a pandemic hits, who knows? This could be with us for two, three years. I don't know. I'm not saying it will. I'm not saying it won't. I don't think anybody actually knows. But the economy could go down. Things could go south. Who knows? Start building that now. Let's go to the next slide. I'm going to give you a case study. This company is in Detroit. Now, as it relates to pandemic and as it relates to shutting down the economy, I think everybody's well aware that Michigan is right there at the top of the list of, of very extensive shutdowns. We, these guys came to the exact thing that we're talking about here. We immediately put them on Facebook and we immediately started putting them on, on radio. We didn't put them on TV because the election was coming up. Inventory was difficult. So we're looking at that for 2021. But immediately we put them on radio, $20,000 a month. That was their spend. The first month they on radio, they did $240,000 in sales in freaking Detroit. We put them on five stations. We came back the month, the second month. We put them on a six station that had been more expensive. So we didn't put them on there at first, but it was still a good fit in terms of audience and targeting. So we came back, we put them on there. Four months later, it's still going strong. Show the next slide. This actually came from the, the uh, station that we put them on after the fact. This is just an example of a lead. Guy's name is Douglas. Here's his phone number. He's from Detroit. I don't know if you can read that. Interested in, I can't read that. What does it say, 28 windows? Look, I'm not saying every lead that comes in from radio is awesome and it's 28 windows. Here's what I'm saying. It generates leads. It works. It absolutely works. You've got to have the right buy. You've got to have the right creative. You've got to manage it properly. But this absolutely can and will work. I know that you've tried it before. I know that it's been a challenge. But if you have any thoughts at all about doing this, I'm going to tell you this right now. This is 100% not something you should approach yourself. You will screw it up. I don't know any other way to say that. I mean, look, if you come over to my house and I, and, and I try to put a roof on my house or I try to install my own freaking kitchen or windows, it's going to suck. I can't do that. But here's what I can do. I can manage 
and buy and execute on TV. You just have to understand that because it's there and because it's easy to talk to a sales rep and it's easy to buy, and just because the station says, hey, we'll make your ad for you, doesn't mean that because the easiness of that system that it's going to work. So next slide. We're going to wrap this up. Here's what we do over here at Level 10 Contractor. We build identity-based websites and we do SEO. Identity-based website, who you are, how you're different, why you're better, what people can expect when they do business with you, stated with power, precision, and passion. That's what we do. We create websites. We create uh, SEO programs that work. We also do Facebook and radio and TV advertising like I just described. Next slide, please. If you'd like to learn more, there's a few things that you can do. Number one, we're going to run a poll at the end of this webinar where you can indicate that you're interested in our services. If you do that, we will contact you and we'll say, hey, what do you want to talk about? Uh, also, you can go to our website, level10contractor.com, uh, or you can look at our Level 10 Contractor Daily Podcast. Go to your favorite podcast platform, whether it be Apple or Spotify or anything else. Just type in Level 10 Contractor Daily Podcast. You will see that we actually do, in fact, do a daily podcast, seven days a week. We're on episode 430 or something like that. We never run out of things to say. You can sort of pick and choose what topics are most interesting to you, and that's a great resource for you. Or uh, you can also email me. My email is rich at level10contractor.com. So that's it for what I wanted to cover, Facebook, TV, and radio. Now I want to go to the next uh, part of this webinar and cover what you do when you actually have a lead. And I am very honored to turn this over to Tim Mush, who I consider the lead handling guru of all gurus. And uh, without further ado, I'm going to have you take the baton and start running here, Tim. All right. Well, thanks, Rich. You know, great information. Uh, let me just recommend, you know, Rich mentioned this podcast, a daily podcast. You know, I, you just get a free PhD education with that daily podcast on marketing. So go ahead and check it out. I think you'll find the information really good. You know, Rich, you mentioned some, you talked about Facebook, you talked about TV, radio and stuff like that. And probably some lead sources that many people that came to this event didn't think we were gonna talk about. I think maybe they're gonna talk about other stuff, direct mail, things like that. Nothing wrong with those kind of things. But your comment kind of struck me where, where you said, yeah, a lot of people have tried like TV, radio and so forth. and didn't make it work and they quit. And then you made a comment that who is doing TV and radio? And I think if everyone was smart, they would they would think about that in their market and they'd probably identify the companies that are selling the most are probably doing TV and radio. So if you want to grow your business- I haven't talked to a single $20 million company that's not, never, not. Yeah, yeah. They all are. It's kind of interesting. And a lot of people say, well, I can't afford it. Well. Here's the other thing you should analyze. Think about those companies that are probably doing the most business in your town. They're probably on TV and radio. And then think about how much they charge for their products. And I will bet in every case, you'll find they're on the highest end of the price spectrum in your market, meaning they got money to work with and spend on things like TV and radio and build that brand. So just a couple of lessons there that I think I think a lot of us don't think of. We think of things like that's that's beyond us and things like that, and it's really not. So give some consideration to that. So next slide, we got this thing where we're talking about you got to lead now. What's next? And Rich Rich uses this, this funnel analogy here, and and I think this is a great way to look at how your business and how your marketing works. You're dumping all sorts of leads in the top end of a funnel, and all sorts of processes take place, and few come out, the other end is sales. So our whole mission here is to try to figure out how to widen out the bottom end of our funnel. So the next slide is gonna picture this a little bit differently. That's gonna talk about really the process we go through to convert these leads, because that's what really matters in your business, doesn't it? Generating leads does you nothing other than cost you money. Converting leads is what takes profits to the bottom line of your business. So that's what we really got to focus on our business is lead conversion. And it really does begin with generating leads, but then it goes through some processes, setting appointments, something we call lead warming, and then the presentation, and then lead nurturing that we're going to talk about. And Josh is going to wrap this up on that. And when all those things happen the way they should, you end up with this great thing at the end, a customer and a bunch of repeat and referral business. And let me add one more out of that, probably a whole bunch of positive online reviews. 
So that's the visualization of really what we're talking about here. Some interesting numbers. The next slide shows something I found very interesting. And we at Market Sharp are, are really quite fortunate because we have access to uh, all sorts of aggregate data from all the folks that use our CRM solution, which is many of you, so thank you for that. But interesting numbers. Here's a snapshot of aggregate data for the month of September, both last year and this year. Some interesting numbers here. Last year, number of inquiries and leads generated in September 2019, 227,000. This year, 258,000. So an increase of 30,000. So we're operating at 113% of last year. Appointments set and demoed, same story, 152,000 last year, 177,000 this year. So we're operating at 116% of last year. But then something interesting happens. Net sales, 2019, 39,000, 2020, 35,000. A decrease of just shy of 4,000. So we're operating at 90% of last year. Net revenue, same story, 317 million last year for this month with the aggregate of these users of market sharp and 297 million this year. So down about almost $20 million or operating at 93% of last year. So I don't know about you, but I find that quite interesting that there's more leads this year, but there's less sales this year. How and why does that happen? You know, there could be a lot of reasons for that. I think maybe a lot of the leads that are coming in now are maybe a little bit more as Rich described at top of funnel leads you know, meaning they're, you know, just kind of entering the, the process of learning about the products that we sell. Whereas if you get leads from shows, events, things like that, maybe they're a little bit farther down that process. So maybe the quality of leads is a little better. That could be one thing. Rich, I know you mentioned something to me yesterday, another theory that you have of why this is, that there's more leads and maybe less sales. Any thoughts there? Um, yeah, I think probably people are sitting at home, they have a little bit more time on their hands and they're doing a little bit more digging. So let's say that historically people have contacted two companies to give them quotes and now they're contacting three. Well, now we've got 50% more leads in the whole marketplace, right? Because people are, of course, look, I just made that number up, but go with the flow on this. So if you've got people becoming leads more often then the conversion ratio across the board is going to be lower because you can only buy once or at least at first absolutely if you look here on this slide the conclusion is more inquiries are coming in during this period turning into more appointments than last year curiously less sales and less revenue which points to the need to improve the conversion process that's where things are going haywire in the conversion process another thing that's possibly happening is when times are good and leads are plentiful, what oftentimes happens in a business? Lots of times the salespeople, the managers, uh, for lack of a better word, they get slothful, meaning they shortcut things, maybe don't do things like they would if leads weren't so plentiful. And that's really in the conversion process. So those are some things we really want to consider. Next slide is going to show a few more numbers I find very interesting, and it really leads us into the conversion process and that funnel we talked about a couple slides ago. Uh, last year is a great year for all of our market sharp clients. Two hundred, or excuse me, two point seven million leads were generated, turned into one point eight million appointments set, which is about sixty six percent of the leads. One point four million leads actually issued to salespeople. Uh, 1 million, a little over 1 million leads actually demoed, turning into 419,000 sales with an average sale of $7,900. So about $3.3 billion worth of installed home improvements. But interesting number on the left. If you look at the difference between inquiries and net sales, that's pretty much indicating that 15.4% of the inquiries that are coming into this aggregate group, which is a big group, 15.4% of them are turning into sales. That's the number we want to impact. We want that number higher. And how do we do that? We take a look at those numbers on the right there, and we just improve everything we do in this process. First off, getting leads. Secondly, converting them to appointments. Thirdly, doing the things that actually get them issued, maybe after a confirmation or something like that. And then what can we do to get leads presented more often? There's certainly things we can do along those lines. And then finally, what, we, what can we do to get more sales from the leads we actually demoed? 
And little improvements in these numbers on the right there can have quite an impact on that number on the left, which has a huge impact on the profitability of your business. So let's go ahead and talk about each one of these things kind of individually for a couple of minutes, and then we're gonna pass it on to Josh. So the next slide is gonna talk about, you know, first off, uh, that second thing in the funnel, Rich already talked about generating leads. So now we wanna talk about the second thing in the funnel in the conversion process. And what that is, is selling the value of the visit. And you might say, huh? I thought I was selling windows. Well, you might be, but you're not gonna get a chance unless you get good at this. And what we're talking about here is setting the appointment. Kind of a fancy way to describe that, selling the value of the visit. But that's really what you're doing at some point in the conversion process. So you get a Facebook lead. You get someone who calls in. You get somebody who visits your website and uh, they submit a form. What typically has to happen is oftentimes it's a phone call to convert that spark of interest to a set appointment. And the question you want to ask yourself is, does our company truly have what I like to call response dash ability? And are you taking responsibility for this important part of the conversion process? So that word can kind of mean two things here. And there's two things critical here. I think you know speed is critical. You can't read this, but this is a bunch of statistical information from a, from a survey done by Harvard, Ohio State on about 15,000 web leads. And they discovered a bunch of stuff. One thing says 78% of prospects convert with the first party to make contact. So when you get a web lead of any type, if you're not with them and on them within minutes of when you get that submission, you're going to miss out. You're truly going to miss out because that's when that homeowner is most interested in what you got is the instant they go ahead and put in an inquiry. So speed is so important. Skill, that's another thing. And here's where a lot of companies really mess up on this. They don't take this part of the conversion process really too serious. So when I'm talking about skill is, again, if it's a phone call you're on, either outbound or inbound, trying to convert that spark of interest to that set appointment, you got to understand the skill you have to have here is to sell, not your product, but as it says on the top of this slide, sell the value of the visit. Meaning why should that homeowner commit to spending time with you to hear the whole story and to find out why you're the best solution for them? And that's totally different than selling your product. You know, the kind of questions that come up on this phone calls, well, how much is this going to cost me? And if your people aren't scripted properly and know how to handle things like that, you're going to lose a bunch through the cracks here. It's going to affect your conversion process. So do you have this response dash ability to convert as many of these inquiries as you get to set appointments? Ask yourself that question. And if you think there's room for improvement, think about speed and skill and go to work on that. So the next slide is going to talk about something a little bit different. And that's something we like to call lead warming. And you might say, hey, what's that? Never heard that term. Well, what that is, is you got an inquiry that turned into an appointment, right? What can you do to pre-position this situation to put your salesperson in a better position and have a better chance to close that sale? There are things you can do between the time the appointment gets set and when the appointment actually takes place. Little things like send them a letter or an email with a picture of the salesperson that's going to come and see them confirming the appointment date and time text message communication with them. Josh is gonna talk about that in a little while. Maybe send them some sort of consumer third-party guide to kind of prep them for the appointment. Little things like that will make positive first impressions for your company that will pay dividends many times over. First off, in things like demo rates, less canceled appointments. And secondly, this will also help in closing sales because again, you built that great first impression for your company. So if you're not doing any lead warming, you know, fortunately, technology can make this automatic for you. You don't have to really think about it. You know, consider doing this. This will help you through the process. Next on our list is the sales presentation itself. And here we're talking about closing the sale. So in other words, you set an appointment, turn into a, uh, first off, you generate a lead. Then you set an appointment. You did some lead warming. And the salesperson actually gets an opportunity to make a presentation, right? So what can they do and you as a company do to improve their chances to sell more and certainly get them sales training. Continually train your salespeople to react to today's consumer. Okay, I could go on and on about that. 
But oftentimes, too many people just, just don't offer training for their salespeople. They just think they should know all this stuff. Nope. Continue to get them training. Secondly, make sure you are leveraging financing in all the presentations your company makes. And it's kind of interesting here. I talk to a lot of companies and say, hey, do you do you use financing? And they say, no, not really. And I say, why not? And here's how they'll answer that. They'll say, well, all our customers pay cash, Tim. And I go, huh, wonder why that is. <laughs> They're paying cash because you're not giving them the option to finance the job. See, here's what happens. It gets down to the pricing of the product. And if it's more than they have, does a typical consumer say to your salesperson, oh, gee, that's more than I thought it was going to be. We just don't have that money. Do they say that? Probably not. They say things like, well, we'll let you know. We're going to think about it and things such as that. And never giving your salesperson the opportunity to solve the issue. But if you will make it a point that every time you present a price, in addition to the price of the project, give them a financing option, whether it's a monthly payment option or whether it's a 12 month no interest option, whatever you want to use, give those options every time and let the consumer decide what's best for them. And if you do that, you're going to get some sales that normally would fall through the cracks right here. Next, you're seeing a few logos on the left there, Engage, One Click Contractor, Leap. These are some great tools that will enable your salespeople to do a better job. Leap and One Click Contractor are great tools to help your salespeople price projects, create contracts, manage the presentation. The folks that Engage, they've just come along recently and they create wonderful presentations for companies to use you know, running on an iPad. And that's what consumers expect nowadays. And for those of you that made somewhat of a switch to some virtual selling, maybe a hybrid uh, sales process that includes some virtual stuff, you know, tools like Engage can really help you pull that off. So check these people out. I think you'll find them very, very useful for you. And finally, if you want to equip your salespeople to close more, you know, utilize Remodely Magazine's cost versus value study. This is a tool I used decades ago back when I was selling windows. And here's the way it works. You know, you get your price ready and give to somebody. Let's face it, in most cases, people don't think the stuff we sell costs as much as it does. They just don't. They don't know what this stuff costs. So what I used to do is have that remodeling magazine issue, cost versus value. And uh, when I would price the project, I would say to them, hey, take a look at what an industry publication has to say about what these types of products typically cost in our geographic area. So they'll browse through the magazine. In the meantime, I'm figuring out the price. And what I used to do is come back to them and I'd have my price on a little piece of paper of some sort. And I would say, hey, you did a little bit of research in the article. I hope you found that enlightening. Tell you what, I'm gonna give you an opportunity to guess what I got as a price for your project here. And if you guess it on the head, we'll give it to you free. You know, and they would kind of chuckle and laugh. And by the way, the chances of them guessing all five, six digits on the head are like none. Uh, but they would take a shot at it. So they would guess it would turn into a little game here. And here's the deal. They would look through Remodel Magazine and quickly look at the kind of product they were considering. And they would determine that, gee, I see in there it says that 10 windows typically in our area typically cost $9,720. So they got that in their head. So when it comes time for them to guess the price, guess what they're going to guess? Something right around there, aren't they? Now, in my case, our prices were a little bit less than Remodeling Magazine's estimates. So I come around and be a hero to have a price that's a little less than what they just did research on. And Remodeling Magazine sticker shocked them. I didn't. So my only suggestion is, is if your prices are higher than Remodeling Magazine's estimates, don't use this. <laughs> Or if your prices are half of what Remodeling Magazine suggests, don't use it either. They'll think there's something wrong with you. But I find most companies are in line with this. Check it out. Again, just Google Remodeling Magazine cost versus value, and I think you'll find it useful. We actually found a little tool. And uh, if we click the slide one more time, what you're going to see here is a PDF that I found that actually summarizes the whole report. You probably can't read that there. But this is a chart that has various types of home service products that we all sell, and it's got the typical cost for them right there. So rather than have somebody have to dig through the magazine, you know, you could use this 
as a substitute and just laminate this and hand it to them while you're figuring out your price and let them do their research right here. If you're interested in this PDF, you know, send me an email at tim at marketsharp.com and just request a cost versus value PDF and I'll send it to you and you can take a look at this and see how this will work for you. It's really a great tool to help your salespeople close more. So let's go to the next slide here. And that's what we're talking about there is closing the sale. The next slide is talking about lead nurturing. And I'm just gonna talk briefly about this. And then I'm gonna hand it off to Josh, who's really gonna kind of tune in on this deal. But here's the thing. There's really two types of buyers that you have out there. You got the now buyers, love those. So go generate 10 leads, hand them to your salespeople. By the way, at an average cost of an issued lead now of about $400 each. So if you generate 10 leads, hand them to your salespeople, you spend four grand. They come back typically with three sales. It's been that way ever since I got into business, about a 30% closing rate. But the question Rich asked earlier on is, what happens to the people that didn't buy right away? In other words, the seven. These are the ones that told your salespeople they're going to think about it, get other estimates and all that stuff. What happens to them? Okay, we've learned that in many cases, they end up being future buyers on the right. Because we've learned through research that 60% of them end up buying a similar project of what they've been investigating with some company within a year. So if you do the math to that, you take 60% of those seven unsold leads, that's 4.2 more sales available there. That's more than you got originally when your salespeople closed three right away. So the question is, is it worth it to stick with these people? Because there's going to come a time when they get a tax return check or something that's going to put them in a position to want to pull the trigger and do that project in 60% of the cases. And that's what lead nurturing is. You know, in the earlier years of home improvement, and even to this day, they call this rehash, typically involved a phone call. And Josh is going to talk to you a little bit more about this in a second. But you got to go beyond rehash in your business. you got to do things continually, as the graphic shows here, to stay in touch with these people multiple times over that next year. And if you do, you're going to get a huge payoff here. And you're going to end up driving a whole lot more business and conversion to your bottom line. So the next slide, just kind of wrapping this up and trying to make sense of conversion. Remember this? We talked about these aggregate numbers resulting in 419,000 sales beginning with 2.7 million leads. Okay, the interesting part there is we probably can't relate to those numbers. So next slide is gonna show maybe a typical company generating 2,000 leads a year using the same conversion metrics that we found to be out there in the field. 66% turning into appointments, 79% turning into leads issued, 75% turning into leads demoed, and 38.9% of demo leads actually turn into sales. Those are the actual aggregate numbers that we found out there. So what does this look like if you'll just get a little better at these things we talked about here today? And the next slide is going to point this out. If you just get 10% better at lead gen and at taking inquiries and turning them to appointments and 10% better at issuing leads and demoing leads and improve your closing ratio from 30 to 33%, meaning a 10% improvement, totally achievable improvements in your business across the board, get 10% better at those things, something very interesting happens to your business. It doesn't grow by 10% because they compound. It grows by 61.6%. Kind of amazing. So hopefully that will be some stimulation to you guys to understand that lead conversion is really where it's at and there's things you can do to improve lead conversion. So wrapping up my segment here, if we go to the next slide, you know, remember this, it's really this funnel thing and we wanna widen that funnel as we get to the bottom uh, and that's really what's gonna determine what we can end up doing there. So I appreciate the time. Let me just give a little quick shout out to what we do at MarketSharp here and many of you are MarketSharp clients and we created a CRM um, customer relationship management system built from the ground up for the business. It helps you generate leads. It helps you convert more leads. It helps you manage your jobs. Uh, it helps you with online reviews. It helps you with production. And really a big deal is it helps you know all your numbers, just like the numbers we talked about here in this little segment. You got to know these numbers so you can see where you need improvement. And the best thing we've done with our market chart CRM over the years, because it's really your core data, 
if you notice all the things on the bottom, you can't read everything, but we made it work with all these tools you use in the business, you know, like level 10, like hatch, like QuickBooks, you know, like a whole bunch of other tools out there, Apex chat, leap, one click contractor. Um, you don't have to double enter stuff. It just works hand in hand with that. So your business runs extraordinarily smooth as time goes on. So with that, I want to bring a good friend of mine into this, and I haven't known Josh that well either, but I want to bring Josh Carter into the mix here. And Josh is the marketing manager at Hatch, and Hatch is a company I learned about, gosh, I think a little less than a year ago. And I'm with Rich. You know, I've wanted to find a tool that can help people automate this process of communicating with leads and customers in a manner that stops things from going through the cracks in a big way. And certainly Margaret Sharp helps do that, but Hatch kinds of takes it one step further. So with that, Josh, you wanna enlighten us a little bit more of, of how you can get these unsold leads to buy in a consistent basis? Yeah, you bet, Tim. And and thanks for the insights, Tim. And thanks for the insights, Rich. Good stuff here. And I wanna thank everybody so far for the attentiveness. I, I recognize we're coming up on the hour. I'll make sure to make this fast. We've got a giveaway uh, coming up at the end of this webinar. so. Hang with me another five, 10 minutes and we'll do that giveaway, uh, answer all the questions that you guys have. But yeah, really the last step of the process is let's get these unsold leads to buy. Uh, let's, that, let's get them to convert. Uh, you know, like, like Rich said earlier, 30% of leads are buying, 70%, what are you doing with that other 70% that isn't buying? So we need to get to a point where we are selling to unsold leads, getting in front of them, getting in touch, figuring out the objection, why didn't they buy to start with, handling that objection, and then closing the deal. And from our perspective, we look at two types of unsold leads, rehashed leads, leads that you recently quoted, but they didn't buy, the traditional rehash after the appointment. And the second is what Tim mentioned, nurture. You know, they get the tax return six months later, they're gonna be hopefully ready to buy uh, you from you. So it's important to stay on top of those old leads in your CRM. So I'm gonna talk about strategies today to tackle rehash, and strategies to tackle nurture. So let's first start with a poll question. I wanna keep everybody engaged here. How are you following up with unsold leads? So I'm gonna launch this poll right now. And I'm curious how you guys are following up with unsold leads. The options are we have a strategy and it's working well. We have a strategy, but it needs improvement. Third is we get to it when we can. And the fourth is we rarely do follow up. So head on over to the poll section on the right hand side. Uh, let me know how you are following up with unsold leads. And so as I go through this section, I'm going to be providing some messaging strategies and tips that your sales team can bring back. So uh, we'll send this presentation out after the webinar as well as the recording. So you'll be able to reference it for your team. All right. So it looks like a bulk of you guys have a strategy, but it needs improvement. Uh, a few of you guys rarely do follow up, but yeah, a bulk of you guys have a strategy, but it either needs improvement in some <laughs> it's working well. So I'm gonna go ahead and close that poll. Thanks for the participation there. So let's start with rehash. Uh, you know, rehash has been a term in, in the space for 20 plus years beyond my time uh, where sales reps would jump in with a high quote, get rejected and lower the price. And what we found is a lot of times the sales rep isn't compensated for rehashed deals. It would be the office manager and the sales rep won't get, you know, any bit of that commission. So they're pressured to do this one call close. And so it makes for a really uncomfortable homeowner experience. And we've seen that all throughout customer reviews for home improvement sites on Google, Yelp, uh, as well as in our own messaging platform. And these are some of the quotes that I pulled out hey, why didn't you give us this price on Friday? And that's an example of a, a millennial buyer from Chicago who clearly knows his stuff and did his research on the price. And the sales rep came in with a super high price and then cut the price as part of a rehash, pissed off Robert, and he didn't buy. Your rep sat on the couch and did not leave until we gave an answer. You guys are 50% more expensive for the same product with somebody else. And the fourth one is something that actually happened to my coworker's wife. Uh, they were getting siding done on their house. Sales rep came into the house. He wrote one legger on the quote because Matt, my coworker, was here at work with me. Uh, wrote one legger on the quote and passed it over uh, to to his wife, uh, and obviously she was no longer interested. So this pre this pressure for the one call close 
uh, and and uh, you know to 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 essentially avoid having to to follow up later uh, and say, hey, if you sign today, you know we'll drop the price another fifty percent or something like that. That that method isn't working anymore. Uh, we've seen it in the data; it's just not as effective. So you got to come up with a better way to rehash leads. I'm going to share with you guys that that process here today. So the old way I talked about earlier, high quote, get rejected, lower the price, a lot of pressure on the homeowner. It's just really uncomfortable, just like I showed you earlier with those quotes that I pulled. The new way is giving the, providing the quote, following up on the quote in a professional manner, getting the rejection, which you know oftentimes happen, price, product, timing, uh, surfacing that objection. You know, why didn't they buy? And what we found is that over text messaging and, and Hatch empowers that for you as a business, text messaging in your business, we find that homeowners are more likely to share the reason why they didn't buy from you because they'll tell you that over text, but may not tell you in person. And we've talked to the contractor the other day who said, you know, they're, they're telling us things that they would never tell us in person. Uh, cause they're comfortable, you know, behind the wall of a text message. So idea here is to service the objection with rehash and then handle the objection, build that consultative relationship to, from the very, very beginning. As soon as you go to the house, you're not pressured to do the one call close sales rep is going to be more comfortable, develop that consultative relationship. And that's going to create that com comfortable and transparent homeowner experience. So old way of doing rehash is just not working anymore. You got to do the new way. And there's a few different strategies here. Uh, of how you can actually execute on rehash. What we found, and Tim touched on this earlier, where uh, on one of the one of the slides he had had some some really good stats, and one of the stats was that it requires multiple touch points before you can get a lead to respond. It was something like four to six touch points. So what we found here at Hatch is when you know the quote, you know, the homeowner says no to the quote at, at at the time of the appointment. And we launched them in an automated rehash campaign through Hatch, which combines texting, email, and voicemails, all automated, done for you all in the background. We found that the most successful home improvement companies are implementing what's called a multi-touch follow-up. So 48 hours after the appointment, send the text, send the email, and then drop a voicemail. We call it voicemail drop. And then day two, send a text, day four, send a text and an email, so on and so, so forth. So you can't just set it and forget it. You can't just follow up once and say, well, they didn't respond. I quit. You can't quit. You got to continue to follow up. Whether you're using a product like Hatch or you're doing this manually, it's important to do a multi-touch follow-up. And like I said earlier, there's three common objections that you're going to find when you put folks in a rehash campaign or you start rehashing homeowners. One is price, two is timing, and three is product options. The most common one, obviously, you guys, is, is price. You all know that. So I want to touch on price objections. So there's a few different ways that you can respond to a price objection. Obviously, be willing to negotiate, but within reason. I think, Tim, you, you shared a really interesting uh, way of handling price uh, as part of that. Uh, I think it was Remodeling Magazine there. It was very interesting. So be willing to negotiate, offer financing options. Tim mentioned that as well. Uh, present special offers that you already advertised. I, I, I bolded already advertised because the last thing you want to do is come about with a random special discount that the homeowner's never seen. And, and you know, millennial buyers especially are, are very tech savvy. They do their research online and they're going to see that you didn't offer that offer anywhere else. And they're going to be, oh, why didn't they offer this to start with? Uh, so present offers you already advertised, own your price with your credibility and quality of work. And that's something that I think a lot of folks forget is owning the price because of your credibility and quality of work. You might have a truck in the truck, and I hate to use that language, but it's true. You might have somebody undercut you on a price, even though you're the best at what you do in your area, but it's just one guy in a truck that's gonna beat you out. That's important that you own that price with your cred credibility and quality of work. So I'm gonna quickly rush through these just to give you the, the quick sound bites here of how to handle price objections. There's a lot of different ways to handle price objections depending on what they say. Uh, I'm gonna focus on just one here. I'm gonna send this after the deck so you can look at it. Uh, but the last one is lower price from a competitor. Rich mentioned earlier that you know folks are online more, they're shopping around for different quotes, uh, more quotes now more than ever. So you're gonna run into this a lot more. So I wanna highlight it. So. They get a lower price from a competitor. They come to you. They said, "I ah, we're not interested. Got a lower price. You know, go, go away. Uh, it's important to come back to them and either compare the quote or like I mentioned earlier, 
own the price since you're the best at what you do. So over here on the right is a message that works really well, uh, a response to this type of objection that works really well uh, coming from a sales manager. Uh, so you might have a rep visit the home, but it's really important to kind of go over top one level or even two levels to the owner and have the message come from them. It, it establishes uh, credibility and trust with the homeowner. So, hi, Mrs. Jones, this is Matt, the sales manager. I got your message about the other quote you received. So option one is, I wanna compare quotes to see what we can do. Are you open to that? And that is an open-ended question. It typically incites a response. Option two is something that I've seen more and more folks do recently, and I think it's absolutely brilliant. And I don't know if a lot of contractors are doing this. So option two is you'll find that our work is the best in town. When you have a moment, go to insert address in their neighborhood and take a look at a recently completed project. So this approach can be, you know, whether it's a commercial job that you did down the street or it's a residential job, whatever it is, uh, encourage them to go take a look at it, especially if it's in progress too. So you could say, hey, look how clean we are. Look how our crew is awesome. You can see half the roof, all that good stuff. So that's one way of uh, owning the price uh, is pointing them either to actually drive to a specific address or sending them a link to your blog post that might have some recently completed projects or a customer testimonial. Whatever you're doing here, it's important to own that price because you're the best of what you do. So uh, again, these are common ways to handle the objections. Uh, I'll send this over afterwards so you can implement it in your business. So the next step uh, in terms of following up with unsold leads, we talked about rehash, which is pretty soon after the appointment. The next step is nurture. Uh, these are leads that are sitting in your CRM for a number of months. It's important to mine your CRM for them. So Hatch, we do a great job. We work really well with Market Sharp and other CRMs to uh, pull in all those leads and automate the nurture process over text, email, and voicemail. So we work really well with Market Sharp. Market Sharp clients see a lot of success using Hatch to do this. So first step is mining those CRM for those dead leads, the quoted leads that you couldn't rehash, as well as previous customers. Cause there might be somebody that, you know, you, you did one bathroom, but they have three bathrooms, for example, or you did the roof and they've got siding that needs replacement. So it's important to mine your CRM to understand that. Uh, the next step is developing that messaging strategy. So for leads that, you know, went dead, educate them with good content, establish that credibility. Quoted leads. Ask if they completed the project to get feedback. So if you quoted them, they fell off the face of the planet, you couldn't rehash them. Look to get feedback on how you can improve in the future. And then they might say, oh, we actually never got that project completed. Well, now is an opportunity for you to jump in. And we see this all the time in Hatch with our customers using Hatch as their messaging hub. Previous customers, did your model one bathroom have three, like I mentioned before? The last piece is put on autopilot, right? Understand what needs to be in your CRM to make this happen. Working with Market Sharp, they're they're great product, a great CRM. You can really customize it to your business. What needs to be in your CRM? For example, you might have a field that says number of bathrooms remodeled, number of bathrooms by the homeowner. Well, if they have one bathroom, you filled in, you did the job for one bathroom, and they have three total, you have a net of two bathrooms you haven't completed. So figure out what needs to be in your CRM to make this happen. Hatch, we can pull all that data in and automate all that messaging campaign for you in the background. So it's important to put this all on autopilot. You guys are busy, you're hopping from job to job. Uh, it's important to put that on, all on autopilot so nothing gets, you know, falls through the cracks. No lead falls through the cracks. So I know I went through this really quickly, guys. Uh, just a little bit about Hatch. We put this all on autopilot, like I mentioned before. Uh, this right here on the right is an example of a multi-step campaign you can launch. We've got dozens of templates designed for home improvement, uh, remodelers, exterior companies, you name it. This is an example of a rehash campaign where day one, we have the text, email, voicemail. Day two, we got the text. Day four, we got the email. And you can record a custom voicemail to drop and it's all done in the background. So for example, as soon as somebody gets marked in market sharp as demo no sale, Hatch will automatically kick off this rehash campaign you set it and forget it. And the only time you need to jump in is when you get an alert on your phone that says, hey, somebody responded to your rehash campaign. Click into here, jump into Hatch and handle that lead and close the deal. So not only that, we also connect up with all your web forms, Home Advisor, Angie's List, Modernize, you name it, uh, to instantly text with that speed to lead, instantly text, email, leave a voicemail for all those new leads that are coming in. We allow you to have those one-on-one -on -one conversations for your entire team uh, in one collaborative workspace. And we work really well with MarketSharp. 
that's why I'm really excited to be on the webinar with Market Sharp as well as Level 10 because we've all been partners for a number of months now. And so, like I mentioned before, status changes in Market Sharp, we automatically you know, can engage with that contact through the rehash campaign, through the nurture campaigns, so on and so forth. So that really does it for uh, how you can you know, establish a nurture strategy, a rehash strategy in your business. Um, so that's about it for me, guys. So I appreciate everybody's time and attentiveness here. Yeah, okay. Hey, thanks, Josh and Tim. Appreciate you guys being on the, uh, the, the webinar today. I just want to say something about this. I uh, alluded to it earlier when I was talking. Uh, the, the technology that's available to make your business run more efficiently, your marketing work better, it's right there. It's inexpensive. And uh, the, the amount of increase, like Tim said, it, what was it, like 62%, Tim? If you do this a little bit, this a little bit, it comes up to 62%. Uh, with Hatch, the, the ability to close another 5% of unclosed leads or something like that, it's there's really no excuse for not using it and the biggest excuse people give is it's just i'm busy i don't have time it's one of those things you're just going to have to sit down and, and figure out because the uh, upside in the roi is is stupid in a good way stupid um let's do one last poll question as we wrap this up and then we're going to do the, the giveaway and we'll be off and done so if you'd like to learn about any of the Companies that have been discussed today, whether it be Level 10 Contractor or Market Sharp or Hatch, indicate on the poll right now. And uh, the respective companies that you're interested in will be in touch with you. And uh, I'll bet you anything that Josh will be in touch with you via text message and, and uh, ringless voicemails and all kinds of goodies. <laughs> Maybe so, Rich. Okay, you that poll launch. My secret. <laughs> I don't see the poll live. Is it live? Yeah, it's live. It's live. Oh, I need to. I need to. I need to click on the correct thing. Okay, we're gonna give you another five seconds while we're doing that. Uh, let's go ahead and start with the book giveaway. Josh, can you select a winner for us there? If you don't yeah. want to, I will. Either way. Yeah, I've got the. Uh, I've got the randomizer here. Hold on, two seconds. The randomizer, it's like a summer blockbuster coming out. Yeah, I have to load all the attendees up and then click at random. Okay, so, um, okay, so for the book giveaway, uh, unlocking unlimited lead flow, the winner is Gina Richardson. Congratulations, Gina. So uh, we'll have your uh, he'll have your information. Rich will have your information and can uh, reach out and get you that book. Congratulations. All right, so now Market Sharp six month subscription to Market Sharp CRM Pro, which is a which is a seven hundred twenty dollar value, uh, absolutely free for six months. Uh, that is going to go to Andrew Nordine. Congratulations, Andrew! And the last giveaway is one month of Hatch. What we'll do is we'll automate that outreach to your unsold leads over text, email, phone by connecting to your CRM, and the winner of that. is Stephen Thacker. Congratulations, Stephen. So Stephen has won himself one month of hatch for free. We'll reach out. Sam, you'll be in touch with Andrew, I trust. Uh, sure. get you there. Awesome. And I know, I know Tim, uh, real quick, somebody asked, Alex Amos asked, do you have copies available of the responsibility statistics? Um, we might want to add that as part of the follow-up too. Yeah, again, um, if you'd like that, oh, the statistics, not uh, not the PDF from Remodeling Magazine. Um, yeah, Josh, I'm not sure what you're going to include in there. Are you going to include maybe copies of the slides? Yeah, absolutely. So there'll be All right. that. Sounds good. Awesome. So we got All a right. Q and A. Yeah. You, you want to take a Q and A? Yeah, I think we had a couple in there. So if you have a Q, if you have a question, guys, hop on over to the Q and A and ask a, a question. Um, I'm glad you guys were able to hop on. The the first question that I see here, this one's for Tim. Uh, it said, Tim, Tim, you said lead nurturing and going beyond rehash. Can I really count on a favorable ROI 
in terms of time and money spent? Yeah. Well, let's review the stats. Remember, 60% unsold leads will buy a similar product from somebody within a year. So let's go through a typical scenario of what this, you know, as Rich would call it, digital rehash, what Hatch does, what Margaret Sharp can do um, to follow up with these people. And I'd suggest you follow up with these unsold leads about 10 times within the first year. Um, so what will that cost you? First off, remember, you spent about $400 to generate the lead. So you got that invested already. So now your salespeople does their job and, and the homeowner says, yeah, we'll let you know. So follow up, maybe, uh, maybe four emails throughout the course of the next year. What's that cost? Well, frankly, it doesn't have any hard cost. <laughs> so you can automate all this stuff. So maybe two direct mail pieces. What's that cost? Maybe 50 cents each. So you got a dollar invested so far and you did six follow-ups. Maybe two phone calls. What's that cost? Mm, there's probably some cost there. Somebody has to spend some time. So maybe $2 each for the two phone calls. So that's $4 plus $1 for the direct mail. So you're up to $5. And maybe two text messages. So you're up to 10 follow-ups. Now in text messages, what does that cost? Again, no hard cost whatsoever. can be automated. So on those 10 follow-ups, how much you got invested? And the answer is $5. Remember, you spent $400 already to generate the lead. Is it worth an additional $5 to increase your chances of converting this lead by up to 60%? So yeah, Josh, I think the ROI is a no-brainer. <laughs> you got this gold in your database that you just need to mine. Yeah. Yeah, I always say you're sitting on a gold mine. That's great. Uh, Gina has a question here. Uh, Gina asked, when is a lead dead? Uh, typically, what we found here at Hatch is about after 14 days, after you provide the quote and the homeowner doesn't respond, uh, it's it's a dead lead. Uh, so a lot of typically our rehash campaigns will run from anywhere from 10 to 14 days uh, after a quote's given. And if they don't respond, you don't get in touch with them, uh, then they become dead. So it's important to know when the lead became dead too. Uh, so it's important to mark that as well. So that way you can reference a time and a place uh, when you go after those leads. So it's about the time a lead becomes dead. Uh, and then uh, one more, one question I will just, and we'll wrap it up here. This one's for Rich. Uh, your presentation about Facebook ads, is that your no risk PPC service that is on your website? No, no, oh, it's completely different. So that, that's a really narrow answer, but I think only the person asking is going to really have a whole lot of idea what that's talking about. <laughs> Understood. And we got one more for you, Rich. How long does it get? How long does it take to get started with level ten to get Facebook ads started? Uh, Facebook ads about two weeks to get up and running. Uh, radio and TV about forty-five to ninety days. TV takes quite a bit longer. Radio shorter. But yeah, for Facebook, it's about two weeks. Awesome. Well, that about wraps it up, guys. Thanks for the attentiveness throughout this whole webinar. Uh, really appreciate it. I know we went over, but this was some very jam-packed. It was one of those jam-packed webinars I've done in a while, Tim and Rich. So this is good stuff. Hope everybody got some insight from it. Awesome. Thank you, too, and thank everybody who was on here. And uh, we'll talk to you, I don't know, next time. Thanks, y'all.